Hey everyone, this is Belinda Carr. Welcome back to the Boost AC podcast, where we dive into the world of construction and explore the stories of people and companies who are shaping the future of our industry. We've got yet another exciting podcast for you today. I'm speaking with Edie Dillman, CEO and co-founder of Be Public Prefab. Thanks for joining us, Edie. Oh, it's my pleasure. Nice to see you, Belinda. So we first connected a year and a half ago at the Passive House Conference in Chicago, and people were raving about your company and what you're what you're doing. And I've been trying to get you into the podcast for a while. So I'm so glad we finally connected. I know it's been a long time in scheduling. You've been very patient with me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm excited. I'm excited about this podcast and the conversation with you. Let's go over just an overview of your company. You have Be Public Prefab. Your company has a team of architects, designers, and builders, with, and all of y'all have a really strong focus on building better. Some of these focus areas are energy reduction and sustainability, among a lot of areas, and we're going to touch on all of them. Um, but l- how did you get started? You're based in um, New Mexico, I believe, and you Correct. started this company around in 2018, 2019. Is that right? Yeah, we, t- we started the company. Um, we had the technology. Um, we're, uh, we rolled out technology that was developed by our partner, Jonas Stanford, in his architecture practice. And he was one of the first practitioners of Passive House in the U.S. So he, he's he been a part of this movement for a long time. Um, so we had the technology and um, we knew we were going to start this company, but we spent almost a year really planning for what our impact, what we wanted to be, how we wanted to design this, how we wanted to grow. We've been very uh, thoughtful. We've had some advisors over the years who've said we're overly planning. We're very, you know, <laughs> we're very thoughtful in what we do. Um, but then we officially launched products and services January of 2020. So um, really been at it for five years um, and been in the marketplace for really four with products and services. So we talked about some of the your focus areas, but what are the main construction problems that you you and your team are tackling? Yeah, well, in many ways, it's um, that knowledge that there's a better way to build um, and that by really um, using the principles of Passive House um, and incorporating into our choices uh, carbon appropriate materials. So not only are we looking at the long-term performance, we're looking at um, the assemblies as a whole and how do they perform together as materials, um, but making choices about, um, and it really for us is about high performance. So the technology really is coming out of Passive House, but it's simple physics. So how do we design for conservation first when we're looking at new construction? So really targeting almost net zero energy demands from the get-go, just from how we build better. Um, and so, you know, we're really um, thoughtful in how we make those choices, but we're also looking at data. So we've done a lot in terms of analyzing our assemblies for vapor openness and for thermal bridging. Um, super geeky when you dig into it, which is, is really fun. Um, you know, some people come to us because they're really excited about the promise of prefab and building much more quickly. Um, but for us, it's not just let's m- build more, build more quickly, but let's make sure that what we build is permanent and thoughtful and really healthy and comfortable for humans and the environment, which sounds very lofty, right? That's like, <laughs> that seems like we're making things up, um, but it's it's just very it's practical yeah. and it's and it's very doable. And there's also like it's almost overly simple in what we have to offer that I think it's surprising to people that you can have so much impact in just better materials and being thoughtful and really pre-designing and engineering that we can kind of design out so many problems that that we're creating in in new construction. Um, so it's really like it's really good news. I talk about this all the time. It's really fun to have good things to share, right? There's there's really great possibilities and better materials that we can work with now. And it's not titanium. We're not talking about building spaceships. These are materials that we've used for 300 years. So I assume a lot of 
your work involves education, education of the architects, education of the clients, because like you said, they, they might come to you attracted to the word prefab, but then they learn there's so much more involved in it that it might be actually better, like high performance buildings, high quality building materials, those might be better for them as a consumer and for the environment than just prefabrication. So for a lay person who hasn't heard of Passive House before, what is your What's your simple definition of passive house? Well, that's a, it's such a good question. And, and um, you know, I, I'll make some of the passive house people cringe by using the most simplistic of explanations that I often use when we're meeting with um, homeowners that are getting ready to design a building and, and, and um, you know, really... In a lot of ways, we call it passive because it uses, you're, you're not continually having to add energy to keep a building comfortable. And so when we think about things that are really efficient in keeping things either hot or cold, um, we think of our stainless steel coffee cups or maybe our Yeti cooler if we're campers. And what does that mean? It's just a really solid um, container that has uh, kind of very well insulated and is airtight so that whatever you put into it in terms of like hot coffee, I'm a coffee drinker. Um, I love that the coffee is still hot in the mug at like four o'clock in the afternoon. And that's really um, sort of fundamental to the principles of Passive House is if you build a better container, what is required to keep it comfortable and that could be hot or cold is just much smaller and it's not constant right? We're not having to plug in that mug or plug in that Yeti. It's um, funny so you say that. My sister-in-law got a, a coffee mug, electric coffee mug for Christmas. And it has to be, it sits on, I think it sits on a little base that's plugged in all the time. And that heats up the coffee mug. So it's hilarious that you're talking about this analogy, because it just made me think of that. It's like, Maybe just have a better insulated mug instead of. An but isn't that one. just the case? I mean, we're we're always creating. You know, you go to the store, um, and you see this. Like people are creating products Pop. all the time yeah. to solve for a problem, right? So that's a great example of like people like me who like really hot coffee, that you're going to plug it in, but everything that we choose to plug in to make our lives more comfortable um, is putting a drain on the grid. And depending on where you are and what your source of energy is, um, and for those of us who like geeking out on this, it's very inefficient to yeah. produce energy, right? What we produce and then have to transfer and what actually hits our home and plugs in that coffee a massive cup. Massive loss just in that It's transfer. a huge loss. So really the best thing we can do, truly the cheapest energy, <laughs> is to not have to use energy. So, you know, build a better mousetrap or a better coffee mug or a better home yeah. or building, right? Um, and that really is just choice of materials. And some people get really uncomfortable when I talk about, you don't wanna live inside a Yeti cooler or a stainless steel coffee cup, but this idea of what is airtight, and that sounds uncomfortable to people, right? It's like, I don't wanna live inside a balloon, um, but what's really brilliant about that is if you are able to control sort of the the container of a home or the envelope of a home and it is airtight what happens a you're not just losing energy out the cracks um but you're able to control the air so all of the the buildings that we're working on have ventilation strategies and and most of them are very high efficient um fresh air intake systems ervs or hrvs and in that you're controlling but you're also filtering the air and so, um, you know, we've gone through a lot. We started this company before COVID hit and then COVID came up and everyone in their homes and apartments and offices became very aware of air quality. Where is air this quality. air coming yes. from? Where's that vent that's sharing that wall coming from? And so when we think about being able to control our environment and use less energy to be comfortable, we're also cre creating these environments where we have filters on the air coming in. So we're working with people who um, you know, we're living in areas where we will always have wildfires, right? And that there are always these moments in seasons where it's great to filter out the pollen. pollen. It's great to be able to control any kind of blooms that are in the air. Um, and so there, this idea of like, let's not talk about being inside a plastic bag, 
and not being able to breathe. Um, it really is about being able to c- control and maintain a healthy indoor. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent description. Thank you for that. Um, See, you <laughs> asked about education, and I just started going into yeah. like, how do we talk about each of these things, all the benefits? Yeah, and that's such a great way to explain it because it's it's a it can be an intimidating, not intimidating concept. So breaking it down into simplistic terms and make creating analogies to everyday life is a way for people to wrap their head around passive house construction, high performance building. And it's 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 not intimidating. It's completely doable as long as you understand the basics of it. So you explain those really well. Well and I think what's one of the things that I think is a little bit tricky in in talking to not just homeowners or building owners, um, but I think architects and designers and, and builders as well. We all experience building failures. Like we've all lived in places or offices where you've got that cold window that you like you pull furniture away from in winter, right? Like there's that room that you're like, no, it always has that musty smell. Like we're just and and this is human that we sort of adapt. We put on a sweater. We move the furniture away, or maybe um, this is my least favorite. We use like a plug-in air freshener. I mean, talk about a problem. If you're using an air freshener in your home, burn a candle. Let's let's down. let's work on yeah. what is the the health of the air, right? Like we actually want to get to the source of what's unhealthy in your home, not mask it. Yeah. Um. And so I think it's tricky because um, people aren't necessarily identifying those as problems. It's just become our lived experience that things are uncomfortable or that you, it's totally normal that your utility bill would dr- jump hundreds of dollars either in summer when you're running air conditioning or in winter where you're running um, heat. That we're just like, we've just adapted and we're not identifying it of like, oh, there's a better way. Yeah. I could be comfortable and basically pay almost nothing for that heating and cooling. We're just... I- Yeah, I think a part of it is also a feeling of helplessness on the part of of the homeowner because for someone who's not in the AC industry, they don't completely understand how a building works or a house functions. They are reliant on the contractor who may mislead them. They may be reliant on uh, repair people who come to your home because they're just saying, I'm not the expert at this. I have to trust you because you are in this field. And they might be misled and and head down the wrong direction. Or even in uh, the case of poorly built homes, the lack of options out there. Like if I'm, I live in Dallas. Every home around me is built to the lowest, lowest levels of lowest quality construction, barely past this code. It's just, it's really sad. And, and it's a vicious cycle because poorly built homes create a great strain on the grid. And then as more people come in, the, the population of DFW just keeps drastically increasing, which again creates a greater strain on the grid. It's a never ending vicious cycle. And I don't think it's entire it is ever the homeowner's fault because like I said, they're not experts at this. It is people like you and other people in the AC community who want to help us build better that we need to take on the responsibility. We need to help change the industry. So, um, well, and why would you know, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it is, it's that it's unfortunate that, um, I mean, they've you got know, we, the millions of things going on in their life. Why would they, why would they know? <laughs> and, you know, for, we, we sort of uh, joke with our clients of, you know, you're really focused right now about designing with the public components for your building, but eventually you'll totally forget about this relationship and forget about what's inside your walls and just be peacefully enjoying yes the space um and so it, it it is really odd to you know for what i do and talking to people about what's inside the walls because it's truly not what you're ever going to see it's not what you're going to see you know an instagram of that like beautiful exactly. finished kitchen it's something that no one really thinks about um and even if you think now like what how is your house built um you know what do you know what's inside your walls and a lot of people will have no idea and why would they? Yeah. Um, and so I think y- you point on a really important aspect of this. There haven't been options. And it's not just options for for um, folks to rent or buy. 
but there haven't been options um, for the construction field um, in terms of material choices and transparency on how things work. And I think, you know, you talk to people um, all the time in this industry and it's not, your your whole house is not built with just, you know, a frame wall or a, a, a panel in our case. And it's not just your windows, right? It's not just a house of windows. It's all of those things and how they interact and how exactly. they connect. And like, so and it's when so we- It's so disappointing that like, new homeowners who want a custom home, if they go to a spec builder, they get to choose paint colors. They get to choose countertop materials. They get to choose sometimes pick pick one out of three layouts of your of your bathroom. They are never given the choice of insulation, like the quality of insulation, whether they want mineral wool or they want something like uh, like wood fiber insulation, a cellulose, something that's more better for them. They're never given those options. They aren't told, hey, do you want ERVs in your, or do you just want four stair ducts? It's, it's just, it's not provided to them. And it's not their fault. It's not. And the only way that we're seeing that really change, I would say, is in twofold. One is through better code, right? Yeah. I, I think when we're adopting um, code that does push the production builders, it does push the industry forward. Um, or in our case, um, developers who want to do better, right? That that know that they can build better. And, and I think an important factor is not just, you know, what is your utility bill, but what is the maintenance? You know what what homeowners in, inherent if if there are you know building science failures if there's mold buildup in that bathroom that they chose the you know the gold package for the finishes but if there's something unhealthy about it or if those windows are going to fail in five years that is sort of a domino effect of instability in the housing market um, and so thinking about how these materials are chosen together, how they work well together, and what what really does match well. Um, and that goes all the way out to those um, finishes um, and how things really perform. Um, and, and I'm thinking about, you know, our walls are vapor open so that if there's moisture, which is natural, if it can dry out naturally, we want it to be able to dry all the way out. So not to put a, a balloon on the outside, right? We want materials that allow that to breathe all the way out into the environment. And I think, um, you know, there are people who are really excited to build better. Um, I think um, there's some interesting things happening in terms of transparency. So that, I, you know, I watch Zillow, you probably watch Zillow, but now being able to see sort of the ratings on solar is this property, you know, a good opportunity to add solar? Um, I think we'll see more and more about the ratings of the health and the performance and the utilities on properties as we move forward. So the combination of, you know, better code and incentives and credits for building better, as well as the transparency in the marketplace of, you know, this is, it's kind of like we think about now like having to sign the the lead or the asbestos on a purchase of a home. It's like, you know, it's we're going to get to that point of, is this a high performance home? Yes, no. Yeah. Right? Oh, this was such a good introduction. I mean, we haven't even dived into your company itself, but this was <laughs> such a great discussion. I have to ask you, what is what is the B in B public prefab? Oh, it's um, it's very specific. It is, we're a public benefit corporation. So when people, when you see B Corp, B Corp on things. Corporation, yeah. Yeah, like Mad Patagonia or Ben & Jerry's. I just saw a new one that was uh, great. Um, but public benefit corps are kind of a combination of a nonprofit. So having a mission and having a vision for the organization um, married with a for-profit company. So a public benefit corp. Um, and the way we're a public benefit corp is we are incorporated in that way. So in our bylaws is the priorities of sustainability and housing creation and job creation, as well as um, being profitable. Um, so those are our guiding principles. And we chose to do that because it was three um, co-founders um, that brought the company together. And we know that this company has huge potential to grow. But we wanted to make sure that that growth is organic and it is aligned to those values that we started the company. And it's not just that we want to be the next Google Google house or something like that. 
we want to grow it for the right reasons. And so being able to track data on um, our impacts yeah. um, along sustainability and materials and um, you know, create creation of housing in particular, but many more buildings um, to this level of performance is baked in. So that's where the B comes from. We also play with it. You know, it's just, it's better. It's better. <laughs> it's building. You can put a lot of Bs there. Yeah. <laughs> I Every time I talk to you, like the first time I I said like we came across, uh, I came across your company at um, the Passive House Conference and people were raving about it and they're like, they're doing something different. They're doing something really great. It's this small-ish company in New Mexico that is really going to change the way things are done. And every time I talk to you, that I'm just, I just remember that saying they're doing something really great, and um, and you're inspiring. You're very inspiring, Edie. Um, oh, thank <laughs> you, Belinda. Well, and I feel like, um, you know, we're trying really to um, to allow people to have fun with this, right? Like we really, I think, you know, you think company, and I, you know, I have the title of CEO, and there's sort of this very stiff and suited, you know persona that I think is CEO, well, that's not what this company is, right? As a company, we're really more of a collaborative and we're really encouraging of, you know, all of those folks at the Passive House Conference to ask questions. It does kind of go back. It's it's not just education in what we do, because I think you were asking question earlier about education. It's also allowing people to explore their curiosities Okay. Um, like maybe they'll see a post or a story about be public and they'll have a question, you know, like truly like really you're, you're building with mostly recycled newspapers. And so like to allow people to have that curiosity um, and to encourage people to, you know, explore things and to support, I think for us working with architects and builders, you know, it's a really hard industry. They've gone through a lot in the last, but you know, uh, uh, 15 years, you know, there's been a lot of struggle, a lot of people really having a hard time digging into their sustainability practice, right? And really achieving their own personal goals for projects. People are having a hard time getting things built. Um, they're, ha- they're struggling with budgets. And, you know, we come at it with, you know, transparency and joy and excitement of, great, let's take your designs. Let us interpret it into sort of our Lego-like system and then go play with it. It's not let's let's like you know let's make it more difficult. Let's make it super techy. But let, everything let's you make, did is wrong. We need to redesign everything you've done. <laughs> no, let's 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 you know let's let's collaborate. Let's have yeah. fun together and let's make it as as high performance and beautiful as we can. Where I think you know there's some drudgery in the industry and allowing for sort of light and joy. To, and creativity to come back into things, as well as people sort of following their own personal mission vision. There's so many people that come to us, builders in particular, who say, you know, we just, we we want to build more. We see there's so much demand, but we just can't get there. And it's like, okay, well, we can help you get it done faster. What if we made it faster and made it something that you feel proud of? That changes how people feel about it. So I love that you're saying that people say nice things about our company. Um, we're thrilled at what we're doing. And I think when you're, you know, passionate and having fun and feel like it is education, it is sharing. Like, yes, of course, you know, we sell products and services, but really um, we're more about moving the market. And when the right project is there, we're the right fit. We're not the right fit for everything. Yeah. And so everything can have a like kind of a joy to it. Um, in a way that I think, you know, if we were just selling widgets, we'd feel really pressured that everyone should have a widget. And <laughs> where is your widget, Belinda? <laughs> yeah, just like you said, finding the right client, finding the right team to work with. So this is a, the great segue into a deep dive in, into the products that you create. You have an image behind you of one of the houses that your company has built. So you have a factory in New Mexico where you all create these panels, high performance building panels um, that are vapor open. Yeah, we do. And we, you and I can have a quick debate about this. Yes, it is manufacturing. So it is a factory, but we call it a workshop or we say at the shop. 
because it is hand built. Like I think you think factory and you're removing the human touch from manufacturing. Um, and it's very much, it's almost a carpentry shop. Um, it's a little bit um, more innovative than sort of a traditional, um, but we're building um, wall panels, floor panels and roof panels um, within the shop. Um, we also use that shop to, to create, um, to explore. And so it's our R and D facility as well. Um, we just launched another, uh, offering in our wall assembly. So we started the company really focused on that passive house like, or passive house certifiable, um, building products. Um, we just added an advanced frame wall. So it's, um, got all that vapor openness. It's fully insulated. It's weather and airtight. Um, and it's all the framing and sheathing but it's a thinner wall and it's more appropriate to many more projects um it's a more affordable panel um, and that but it came out of the r d division it did it came out of r d and you know for that r d incorporates you know what it, what is code pushing on what do we need to help builders achieve in many more districts um it's what are the uh, materials available to us um and then really importantly, listening to builders and architects of what they desire. You know, we've, I think we've done six new generations of the panels themselves. And every time we make a change really is in response to builders saying, I really wish, and we say, great, this product is for you. Great. We'll make that change. Um, and for us, as long as we hit our performance measures, that's great. So the advanced fair mall is not thermal bridge free. However, it is totally vapor open. It's packed with recycled newsprint or cellulose. Um, and it will achieve certainly 2021 code, but for um, multifamily or larger um, form factor buildings, as well as in milder climates, it's perfectly great for a passive house. So being able to offer, um, you know, sort of mix and match panels for an entire, and I say envelope. Well, Linda, what do you think is the right, I sometimes say shell, like a building shell. It depends on who we're talking to, right? Um, but not every project uses our floor panels, but we are rare in the panelization world that we do offer fully insulated floor cassettes. Yeah. Um, we do uh, roof panels in two different R values. Um, and so different, you know, sort of insulative um, pitch factors. Or we do pitch roofs. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we do have sort of a standard kit of parts, um, components, um, but a lot of what we're doing is custom. That's what's kind of amazing is this, the computer assisted design, right? Like everything we have in this beautiful BIM now um, and the technology on our computers, um, we can design any, you know, and I want to say square corners. We like square corners in general. We're not doing rounded. So when I say custom panels, they're not round. Um, but we can create um, designs for anything in the computer. And then it's hand built in our shop. And so that combination of um, accuracy and, and controls from the computer and then accuracies and the quality um, assurance that we have in the shop. I almost said factory again. Um, is pretty astounding. And so pairing those two things for flexibility of anything from like a, a casita, I'm in New Mexico, so I can say casita, or, you know, a guest house to, um, you know, townhomes, three-story, larger multifamily. It's the same thing in the way that we're a building material, like a two by four, right? It's what can you do with a piece of wood? Um, that's pretty close to what we're doing. Um, just doing it with a lot of insulation, some best in class materials. Yeah. And that that really stood out the, the first time we spoke, your focus on humans. It, it Obviously, that is one of your biggest passions and your company's biggest passions too. It's not about automation to you. It's about creating high performance buildings while still valuing the human aspect of construction. And you told me that your approach to building B public prefab was starting off with a low cap factory, a low cap, not factory, sorry, 
<laughs> you can say factory. <laughs> uh, okay, a low cap factory and invest in trades and invest in humans. That was your approach, not. And, and there's nothing wrong with the other approach of the other companies that I've spoken to that go down the path of robotics or creating these lines where everything's done by machine with minimal human in intervention. That's just a different approach. Um, but your approach really focuses on humans and you want your the, the people working in your factory to not have to travel more than, I believe you said, 45 minutes to an hour or something from where they live to where they work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... Um... You know, you you have um, interviewed a lot of really amazing companies that have a different approach to manufacturing than we do, and I and I just want to say really clearly, the need is so great, we need all of it. Exactly. Like we yeah. really need all of the innovation that's out there. Our approach and our philosophy, and this does go back to that we're a public benefit corporation, is um, we have such a shortage in the trades. We really have a deficit. And that deficit um, is only going to get worse. And so how do we ensure that there is um, future tradespeople in every community? And so we really feel like one is creating pathways into the trades where it is um, open and you can see a pathway, um, certainly walking through the front door of our shop and walking into the office and being able to look through the glass wall and see all of the different stations and understand that everything is, you know, at ergonomic height and, you know, adjustable to any size person um, to be working in the shop. And then it doesn't require a truck. It doesn't require all your own tools that you can start a career and be trained and paid to be trained in a facility like ours. Um, and our belief is we want that localized because we want our teams to stay within the building trades and go out, you know, after they've really completed their work and are ready for the next challenge to walk out and start their own GC firm in that community or start installing our panels for clients or start, you know, selling or become an architect. And so we really want this to be a full ecosystem. Um, and I think there is there's a lot um, to be said for learning to measure twice, cut once for everyone. Even though in time we may add some robotics, we may have CNC and things like that. We still think it's really important to have the values of hands-on work and understand how things go together. And I would say that's true for us around architects as well. It makes a lot of sense to see how things come together so that you can understand and respect what it is that is done both in the shop and out in sight and what make things you know work well for people and makes it smooth for everyone. So um, we're really committed to this smaller localized um, shop deployment. So over time, we will continue to grow these shops and it's, it's not a huge investment. You said low cap for some people, they wouldn't understand what that is, but for us, that means sort of a low capital barrier to starting manufacturing. And when we launched the company, the idea was that even in a community college in their trades program, when nobody was there over the summer, we could be building panels, right? Like let's take advantage of equipment and spaces that are available and start building rather than making it this you know, huge investment yeah. um, and displacing sort of the human element. And I would go back to joy of working with your hands and making something come together. Uh, we just had our, our staff in the Las Vegas, New Mexico shop. Um, they were able to go to one of their projects once it was installed because they've of course been building these beautiful panels and they hadn't um, been able to see it up and built. And it was such an excellent opportunity for them to really appreciate that they're a part of what's happening out in the yeah. field. The pride um, and the joy that you, when oh, you was, see something. It was dynamite. Way. And because of that experience, we've actually changed how um, we track the production of a house, you know, rather than just the individual sheets for each shop drawing. They actually have a diagram of the whole building on the wall, and they get to fill in the panel as it goes into storage once it's stacked and completed. 
So they're really like they're visualizing building that whole building in a way that gives them that that same sense of pride as being on site. As opposed to just, okay, I'm screwing this one. Or just checking it off the list. They're visualizing the whole building that they're they're producing. That's a good approach. Again, that goes back to continuous feedback and and collecting data. How can I make this line in this? That's really cool. Um, Is there, um, you just mentioned a project that your company built in Vegas or um, New Mexico. Was there a memorable project that your company worked on in the last four years or so that really stood out to you? Either changed the path of your business or changed the way you thought Be Public Prefab needed to grow? Um, yeah, I, I have to say that each project is so, you know, meaningful and, and close to close to us. Um, we've been really um, honored to help um, many homeless build back after wildfires. And I think that was a very surprising turn of events. Um, you know, one, the devastation of the fire events Is that, that we're having. Both in California and in Colorado and now in New Mexico. Um, and so, you know, we did a lot of planning around the communities we could serve with this system and with our design services. Um, and it has been a, a surprise that it has been so useful to homeowners who are building back. And I would say they have a different sort of ecological view than everyone else when you've lost a home. You think differently about the performance or your investment or even the materials. Um, And so that has been, um, for a mission-driven company, um, very meaningful for our team to be able to help people get back home and to build sort of a better future coming out of that devastation. So that has been a wonderful surprise. um, And I feel very honored to work with those communities, talk about resiliency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, to not just um, give up and say, "Okay, I'm going to live in a different." No, place. the human spirit yeah. and how those communities um, support each other is really. Um, I just feel again really honored that we were included um, to be able to help folks. Um, and right now, it's exciting because we're definitely turning a corner this year, 2024. Um, there's been a big shift. Um, there are many more multifamily projects coming through, estimating and moving towards production. Um, and so we will always have a mix of things designed by us, designed by other architects, smaller projects, and then larger projects. But right the second, um, we're in production for a lecture hall. So our first real public space or a uh, commercial project is in production right now. And it's totally different than um, what we sort of imagined. But that's the beauty of producing um, a, a, an assembly for architects. It can is, be used for so many purposes. Is what they do with it. What of course, we love it, yeah. designing with it. But it's just a blast to see what others do with the technology that we've developed. So this is really fun. And this is actually, it's in New Mexico. Um, and so that will be installed um, probably late summer, early fall, and will be dynamite to share with people. Um, it's a really fun to one. Seeing that. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. This has been an amazing conversation. I was like, it's like I said at the start of this, I was really looking forward to it. Um, what are your future plans for B Public Prefab? You mentioned maybe starting up some more low cap um, facilities across uh, around the country. Maybe that would help reduce your carbon footprint in transporting these panels to the job site. Uh, do you see that happening in the next three to five years or so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I spend a lot of time talking with communities, and and for us, it, it's sort of a three sixty view of where we will go we you know we want to have good training partners we want to make sure that there is demand in that community um so we talk to large neighborhood developers of of setting up um, either permanent or temporary manufacturing in order to satisfy their projects um and i think because we're really interested in that workforce and training that's really exciting um we talk a lot with 
um, organizations like Habitat and nonprofit developers in how can we incorporate our approach and our technology and our manufacturing into their goals for housing creation and job creation. So there's some pretty exciting things happening with that. Um, I do think um, we'll be pushing into some new areas. Um, I see Arizona and Utah coming in for a lot of projects. So we've been in California and Colorado and New Mexico. Um, I see some new states pushing in. We've got projects in North Carolina that will come oh, up wow. this year and that's really exciting. Um, so continuing to partner in growth. And again, it's a collaboration. So some of our work, um, we have trusted manufacturers that produce on our behalf. We will continue to add to that um, network of um, people and, and we're building out more and more training for them as well. Um, we didn't really talk about it, but we developed this training program for builders to learn how to install panels safely. Oh, oh, okay. And so we'll continue to do that. And we've been asked to travel that, um, which is funny to imagine us, you know, crossing the country with panels because we do in, we do training with a crane and let people <laughs> put together a building. So, you know, we like logistics. So that is it would like be a mock up that you show them how it's installed and then you just take it apart and then move those it's it's a full it. size mock up that we okay. we do so we do a two day training where we're going through building science and and a lot of the material science and talking about how does prefab change schedules and estimating and um it's a pretty wow. um yeah, well rounded two day program and then we actually fly panels with a crane um and so that will likely um go on the road a little bit in the next couple of years um we've and been would asked that be like a brand agnostic kind of training it's it's just uh even if they decide not to use be public prefabs panels if they decide to use someone else's panels they still have the knowledge of how it comes it, together yeah yeah it is i mean there's there's um some very specific things about our engineering and our connection points but this was something when we were launching the company and talking to the industry Talking to people that, you know, some would say are our are, are competition, I would say are collaborators in the industry of change. Um, and everyone identifies this as an issue, is that we may have the workshops and the factories and great products, and we definitely have the need for new construction out in the field. But the folks who are really the set and stitch crews and are ready to perform that work are far and few between. And I would say, um, many more in the commercial side. Like we've been building hotels and restaurants and things in sort of modulars for a time now. And, and those larger commercial um, contractors have experience. But when we talk about smaller and midsize uh, developers and uh, GCs in residential, they don't. And so we, ha we talk to you know um, other folks in panelization and offsite and they all said, yeah, it's really hard. You can't, Who, who's going to install them? And we had that problem and we said, okay, well, we're just going to start this program and it will be of great advantage to other folks in the industry. And for us, they're all over the country. So we've trained people in, you know, Vermont and Maine and Tennessee and California and Texas and Arizona. Wow. So we have these, you know, dispersed groups who are trained. And most of them are um, teams that come. So we'll like a framer, a framing team would come because they know that this is the future and they kind of want to add it to their toolkit. Um, others are GCs who want to be able to uh, self-perform the, the whole project rather than hire a sub to do that work. So um, I'm sorry, I just took us off on a tangent, but it no, is no, it's really something that's growing and it's a part of the larger movement, it certainly serves our projects, yeah. but it serves the industry in that promise of getting it up and built. It doesn't yeah. make sense if you order panelization and it's on site and, and, and no one knows how, how to put, put it, it together. together. That's yeah. not a, that's not pro progress. Yeah, and um, so I talked about that. It's funny. I had a conversation about this just yesterday. We have a prefabrication team that I work with. And then we have a GC team out on the job site. And there's a big gap on when stuff gets passed over to the GC team because they don't know how to install it. 
and then they, the prefabrication team thinks that they have to be hands off as soon as we get the project and that that gap right there is what you're talking about the the knowledge that the the assembly gc team needs is lacking right now and we're trying to figure out how do we fill it? Are we the ones that's, that, that educate them? Uh, do we need to bring someone external to educate them on how we install these prefabricated components? And what you're doing is, it's. I'm so glad we went down this tangent because it is an extremely valuable part of it. Like what's, you can't just develop these panels in silo because if it's installed incorrectly, what's the point of it all? <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, for us in particular, and I think there are a lot of great companies who are panelizing um, we're not displacing the GC on site. Yeah. Right. We're only taking a small portion of the build and speeding it up. It's what we find to be the critical portion of the build for performance. Exactly. And obviously that, for and structure. And a lot of like, people think that it's not prefabrication versus GC. It's not. It's not a no. competition. It's not. It, there's no point in butting heads in this. We're trying to help each other get better. So that, and that's what your team's trying and to what, do. And what that linkage is, and I think to be fair, I think it's really important um, that we that we represent this training. It's the same skills used slightly differently. So why we can do it in two days is because we're using materials that are known, that are basically off the shelf. It's how you address them, how how you order them on site, how do you sequence that changes. So for us, you really would want windows and doors on site on day eight rather than on the fourth or fifth month. That's a big shift. Yeah. But it's still the same materials. It's still the same, you know, basic install. So how we how we reorient and sort of skill up people, and I think importantly to be safe. I think there's a lot that we can cowboy out in the field and and that's not what we want to do. We want to make sure that people are safe, um, are protected, that materials, uh, you know, there's the re reduction in, in risk. Um, so the training's important. Um, and we've talked to lots of people about partnering with it. It should be a stackable credential. It should be coming out of a university. This should be a part of the trades program um, and likely will be. Um, we're in talks with a, a couple of local organizations um, um, community colleges to add this to oh, maybe great. their sustainability or the construction management programs, that this would be something that would be additive and gives them sort of that step up yes. into careers. That's awesome, Edie. This has been an excellent conversation. I have one last question for you, and I try to ask all my interviewees this. What advice, I mean, this whole this whole podcast has been a ton of great, really great advice. But what advice would you have for a young professional coming into the AC industry who's really interested in high performance building? Would you talk, would you want to emphasize the the hands on aspect of it? We talked about that during the podcast. What about the the well rounded knowledge, like having the the tech side of it, the material side? Um, that, that, I mean, there's so much that you you that's important but to a young professional what's one of the what's one advice that you would give them oh i have so much what i want to tell them <laughs> <laughs> come work for us no i think um i think one is to be truly cur curious um and then to be ambitious um we've we've had a lot of um young very talented um, designers, architects uh, tell us that it's disconcerting to come out of school to really want to have impact in your work, to want to have some real influence around sustainability um, and them feeling um, voiceless or without power to really do things. And and I, I want to encourage people that there is so much power in the industry to do better and that you know if you're in a place where people are not valuing that curiosity get up or supporting yep. education like if they're not sending you to the passive house conference or encouraging you and paying you to do workshops online or to continue studying um that it's not the right fit that we really do need to have high rigor but also just ambition around 
making change and implementing it immediately. Um, so I think there should be a lot of, you know, folks who who want to make a difference in their careers and have their their work life balance makes sense because what they're doing at work is a part of their life values is possible yeah. and you should ask for it yeah that's that's really great advice and i hope thankfully i had recognized that really early on like after i got out of college and got into the workforce i was in a pretty toxic work environment and they were not supportive of me wanting to learn more about automation learning wanting to learn more about building better and i said it's not the right fit for me there has to be something better out there i'm going to find it so i completely agree with what you're talking about there there, uh, there is something out there and if there isn't just try to create it to yourself and the you will find the community there you're not unique there is a community out there just like th- that's the path i went down like i, I couldn't find the right people to reach cuz i didn't have a good network i wasn't good at building a network so i kind of created stuff in isolation by myself and try to learn something new every day and the community i i just found the community org- organically found people like you found the passive house community all this stuff it just happened just because i took that initial risk just stepped out of a toxic workplace and try to find something better yeah well and i would say those passive house people are very welcoming Yes, absolutely. That's <laughs> They're true. very encouraging of that. And I think we're in a very fortunate moment in time that you can do so much online. Yeah. You really can meet with incredible mentors and ask for, you know, uh, connections from people through LinkedIn or in social. Um, but to just you can show up and ask for better and look for those opportunities. Um, they're out there. I mean, I think there's really amazing things happening um, and that we do. We need to have sort of higher hopes for our work lives, um, that it's not just a paycheck, but that we're doing work that's important and, and that we value our own time by doing that work. That's true. Well, thank you, Edie. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and telling us about what B Public Prefab is. I'm looking forward to seeing how your company grows and how it can impact our industry. Thank you so much for having me, Belinda. Thank you. All right. Need to have you back on the podcast again soon. Okay. All right. To deal. <laughs>